It is fantastic to see all of you today. About 10 months ago in Berlin, we had a gathering of about 450 people for the Cloud Foundry Summit Europe, the first one ever. Uh, 10 months later, I'm happy to say that we are sold out. We sold out a week ago. Uh, there are over 700 of you uh, registered and in attendance today. So I think we're gonna have an extraordinary two days of openness, of collaboration, and sharing information and ideas openly. So first, let me do an exercise. Please raise your hand if you were at the Berlin Summit. All right, keep those hands raised, and raise your hand if you've been to the Silicon Valley Summit in Santa Clara. Oh, some people have both hands up, that's pretty awesome. All right, so those of you who don't have your hands raised, look at the people with their hands raised, they are your experts, they will help you understand things. Okay, go ahead and put your, put your hands down. Now if you're new, we're gonna reverse the exercise. So if you're new and this is your first Silicon Valley, your first Cloud Foundry Summit, please raise your hand. All right, so all of you who raised your hand before, look, at, look around the people with their hands raised. Make eye contact. I know we're introverted, but make eye contact and commit yourself to help somebody out. All right, thank you. One of the key things to who we are as a community is we are open and we are inclusive. I've found that this has been the greatest privilege of my professional career to lead such a collaborative and helpful set of people. In that spirit, I've stolen a great idea from Robert Piercig. Some of you may have read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where through a journey across a country and fixing his motorcycle along the way kind of walks you, walks the reader through the experience of Zen. I feel very similarly about my favorite platform, Cloud Foundry. Those of you who have seen this image before know as an ENSO. It's uh, Zen calligraphy, which indicates openness, emptiness, nothingness. To me, it's also inclusion, which is all about what we're doing here today. I wanna talk a little bit about open source and why we play this game. And then I wanna talk about what Cloud Foundry is and where we're going as a platform. So open source is a positive sum game. If you're familiar with game theory, which many of you are, you know that there are two types of games we can play. We can play zero sum games in which in order for me to win, you have to lose. Those are kind of interesting, but they're not transformative. Last time I was in Europe was the beginning of July where to, uh, I think, our collective shock, uh, the Germans lost to the French in the Euro Cup. So that was kind of astonishing, but you know they'll just come back and play the same game again next year. So this is just kind of win and loss. Some people are happy, some people are sad. More exciting and more transformative are positive sum games, where the more of us who play the game, the better the game itself becomes. Those of us who have been in business for a long time sometimes are a little bit baffled by positive sum games but I think the best way to understand this is something that we're all born playing, which is the game of love. The more that you give, the more there is available, the more that will return to you. There's no limit to the number of participants in that game that can make it better. So I'm inspired by the writing of Robert Wright. About 10 years ago, I read a book that transformed my thinking about economics and civilization. This is a book he put together called Non-Zero, The Logic of Human Destiny. Rather boldly, he asked the question, is there actually a direction in which human civilization is trending? And he came back having done his research, surprised, and said yes. In fact, the history of civilization is a history of positive sum games played at larger and larger scales. So the scale of the game he offered is, how many people can you call self instead of other? As human beings, we really like to draw a very bright line between self and other. Me, them, good, bad, trust, no trust. What we really want to do is create uh, an elimination of that boundary and have a lot of people in our circle of trust. That lets us to play these transformative positive sum games. We generally start out with the smallest possible scale, right? Self equals family. Blood is thicker than water. You will engage in transactions with your family probably without counting how much money you spent doing so, who owes who what, right? This is the general basic structure of a positive sum game. You don't keep score. You're just all trying to win together. Now, that's a simple polity. I like this term. It's a very clean description of how we organize ourselves and how we give power to each other. Maybe the earliest strong polity was a tribe. Many people here are familiar with the Dunbar number, about 150. 150 people that you can be in simultaneous relationship with. Now, you might be able to know 1,000 people. LinkedIn tells us that if you don't have 2,000 connections, you're not even really trying. So you could probably remember their names now with the help of technology but who can you really care about and be in conversation with? As we go through civilization's history, we find that the more people that can play a positive sum game, 
the better they compete with smaller groups. So chiefdoms exceed and consume tribes. City-states exceed and consume chiefdoms, and on and on. Nation-states then are born out of city-states, and these transitions are usually very uncomfortable. There's usually a lot of chaos, because this idea of giving up authority and trusting more people to be in a positive sum game with you is very emotionally challenging. Perhaps we're on our way to a world state. I suspect we're living through a, a reaction to this sense of greater unity and greater connection right now, and hopefully our politicians and our citizens will take us into a place that's more aligned with the long arc of history. Here's a positive sum game that almost all of you are practicing right now, right? Self equals company. You've met somebody on a plane who is working for the same company that you've never met. You share almost no affiliation at all, but somehow you both work for the same employer. It's a fairly ahistorical construct. It's one we played around with just for a couple hundred years. Certainly not something that we've done for thousands. You immediately think, I can trust this person. I can engage in positive sum transactions with them. I can tell them about confidential information. We can create a new partnership. So that has progressed over time, and now we see that the world is largely influenced by multinationals. So these are companies that have figured out how to play positive sum games with an enormous number of people. This has also created a huge asymmetric power base that caused a reaction. In the 90s, the basis of software competition was one in which the companies that could organize themselves to have the most money and the most employees were inevitably the ones who, who prevailed. Right? If you can take 5,000 engineers and put them on a single project and they all work for you, then you're going to beat every other company. But then something really strange happened. We came up with a new policy, self equals project. So if you were a Linux developer working on the kernel or working on a distribution, it didn't matter what company you worked for. You felt a self-identity with anybody else working on Linux. You were all the same band of rebels. It didn't matter if you worked for IBM or HP or Red Hat or a startup. You felt like, wow, we're all part of this Linux community. And so we learned a great deal about what would it mean to have some different kind of affiliation that was not your nation, that was not your corporation. It's open source, right? We align ourselves to projects. Bringing ourselves together, right, bringing unity around a particular project increases as we increase the number of different types of people that we want to interact with and support. In Cloud Foundry, we think about developers, users, providers, and operators all coming together, having unity and affiliation around the project. Uh, the team from Swisscom is here. Swisscom is a great example of a provider right, who has participated in this circle bringing out a side of the software that we wouldn't have seen if we were simply trying to build software and sell it in the traditional way. Everyone participates in the circle. Without developers, you have no apps. Without users, the apps have no value. Without operators, the apps won't stay up. And without providers, you won't have an infrastructure to run them on. So it requires all of us. Notice that we're all on the circle. Nobody's in the center. Nobody's excluded. Nobody's on the edge. So it's about inclusive, inclusiveness so that we're all playing the same game. That's what Cloud Foundry is for. Cloud Foundry is also a platform, and platforms themselves are positive sum games. So if you're familiar with the structure of a platform, it's an inverted pyramid, a massive inverted pyramid, quite the opposite of our old common sense of how we create power. Rather than sitting on top of the pyramid and lording it over everyone, our job is instead to be a servant leader and sit at the very bottom, supporting products, services, solutions, and users. Most importantly, being able to bring in users to get value out of the entire solution. But we also know software is tremendously tricky. It's very hard. It has to be custom fit to every different situation. So this idea of creating a platform that can be provided, run everywhere, and be modified by many people in the chain is incredibly important. This is also how we think about sustainability and how money should flow in a platform economy. The smallest amount of money should be flowing down to the platform. The greatest amount of money, opportunity, and employment should be at the upper levels of the pyramid. So if we think about this idea that the more people we can support, the greater the platform, the people that we're supporting is actually the, the technical measure of how important the platform is. As we increase the number of people on the platform, we get another benefit. Platforms drive network effects. So those of you who use your telephone automatically know what a network effect is. There's a great joke which says the, the greatest salesperson in human history was whoever sold the first telephone. How useful is a phone that you can't call anybody on? Well, as soon as you have the second phone, 
at least you can call one person. By the time you have the third telephone, you can call three. And quickly, you get n squared effects, right? Metcalfe's law and network effects. Everybody starts to come in. Most interestingly, people who don't have phones then get told offline, hey, you should really get a phone. Why should I get a phone? So we can talk to you. So you end up with these external subsidies where everybody's recommending the system. So platforms and network effects are the basis of how we think about most of the successful modern asset light digital businesses. So if you think about Uber or Airbnb, uh, if you think about eBay, you think about these different systems which create multi-sided markets. Duolingo is a great example for those of you who have heard of it. Those were studied in detail by a few people at MIT. Uh, Jeffrey Parker, Marshall Van Alston, and Sangeet Chowdhury. They're part of the MIT Institute for the Digital, Digital Economy. What they found was very simple. They walked away from all this and said, all these platforms have figured out how to create massive network effects to be able to create environments where more suppliers bring more suppliers, more suppliers bring more consumers, and sometimes consumers and suppliers will switch sides. So those are very powerful. So the more people we can include, the greater the network effects. Hopefully this is giving you a sense of why mathematically, not just ethically, it makes tremendous amount of sense to create markets out of, out of positive sum games. If we look specifically at who we want to include in Cloud Foundry, the more of each of these that we include, we have found that we get more and more excitement, involvement, and execution on the platform, which is really what we should be measured by. Is this working? Is it serving people? One of the people who I think put this together most intelligently was Kishore Swaminathan. This was in late 2009. He's now the emeritus chief scientist of Accenture. This was just one of eight things that he wrote, trends that are changing our world, and then he retired. So you just get an imagination of this just being one topic, first person to really put this together thoughtfully. So he talks about an ecosystem of mutually reinforcing technologies. Many of you have uh, supercomputers in your pocket, right? Some of you are even using them to take pictures. That is a part of a system of reinforcing technologies. Some of the other things might be lightning cables or other cables that plug into the phone. Sometimes you upgrade the platform itself, improve the capability of the camera. The apps that sit on the phone, all of those are really this, this little set of red triangles. Those enable us as users to come and adopt the platform, make it real. It reduces our risk. So here's a question. How many of you in the last six months have recommended an app on your phone to somebody else? <clears throat> Show of hands. Okay, so those are the ones who are not shy. I suspect that every single person in this audience, because you're technologists and you chose to come to a technology conference, you're probably just a little bit evangelical. You probably want to give away a little bit of knowledge and make a recommendation. So let me ask you this. How much did you get paid to make that recommendation? In fact, could you have been paid to make the recommendation? Would that have cheapened the exercise? If the company could have paid you, could they have afforded to pay you for their recommendation? Would that have scaled? Almost certainly not. You gave them what's called an external subsidy. They couldn't have afforded this, but you gave them part of what benefits this kind of network effect. And I think as humans, we live out of two main drives, right? Hope and fear. So probably a little bit of you was stimulated by hope. Like, I have this really cool thing I want to show it to you. But one of the most important parts of Swaminathan's curve is this idea that as the technologies reinforce themselves, they reduce risk for adoption, and that, that goes back into the circle. So one reason why you recommended that app is because you really like it, and other people using it make it more likely the app will survive. It reduced your risk, both for the app you're using and for the entire platform, the phone that you are on. So this is a really important way to think about platforms. You may build, be building a platform business, or you may simply be engaging in Cloud Foundry as a platform. Either way, these are the physics of modern platforms. So this is a pretty good standard, right? One of the things we think about in platforms is standardization. Anybody think this is a good standard? Incandescent light bulb. You know, largely unchanged since the late 1800s when it was invented. Uh, it's got about 40% more efficient. Um, recently outlawed by uh, countries like Australia for being inefficient and waste generating. This is maybe a more interesting standard. To me, this is a platform. This is a pretty opinionated platform. In fact, if you don't have something that will fit exactly into that holder, then you're not going to get any electricity. The contact won't complete and nothing will happen. But once you standardize on that platform, then we can have many very different opinions about what goes into it. So here's a compact fluorescent. 
to CF. See what I did there? All right. So even more interestingly, here's an LED light bulb, right? So we're in a moment where there's a massive replatforming of light bulbs going on across the world. In the next five years, something like 80% of the commercial light bulb fleet just in North America will be replaced. The most fascinating thing about this is it's a computer. So those of you who are here to talk about Industry 4.0 with other people and participate in that track, think about the Internet of Things. Here's a thing, right? It's an LED. It's an integrated chip. We're adding sensors for temperature. We're adding mesh networks. So each one of these things, plugging into that old standard platform, can bring a completely new world to bear. So in that sense of creating a standard platform, we are trying to create the same thing for you with Cloud Foundry. So last year, we launched Cloud Foundry certification. Cloud Foundry certified 2016. We took the step of time stamping it. Later this year, we will announce the standards for Cloud Foundry 2017, and we expect all of our certified platform providers will support the new standards, including Diego. Anybody here heard of Diego? So you'll hear a lot more about Diego at this conference. Diego is awesome, right? Super modern, incredibly scalable, and open and connected to all of the most modern advancements in containers. And in fact, we're at the forefront contributing things like services and advancements in how we attach storage to containers. There's a lot of opportunity for us here. If we take that and standardize the platform at the bottom of this system, this platform ecosystem, then what we're hoping to do is create an open, mutually owned, industry-wide platform for all of you, no matter whether you're a platform provider, whether you're, you're a developer building products, services, or solutions, or if a, you're a user, depending on this platform, to deliver your experiences day to day. Excitingly, we're bringing a posse. So today, we're announcing that Cisco is the most recent signatory to the platform standards for Cloud Foundry. So they're launching a Cloud Foundry certified uh, Cisco, Cloud, uh, Cl Cisco platform today, joining our other 10. Anybody here a Spinal Tap fan? Okay, so just to be clear, how many certified providers do we have now? 11. It's like 10, but it's one more. Um, once we've standardized that platform, where are we going with it all? What we want to do is open up an entire world of package services and packaged apps. Those of you working on Cloud Foundry today know that it is the best platform for custom applications, right? The, cons the consistency, the coherence, your ability to update code many times a day, many times an hour, and put it directly in production is fantastic. Almost all of that code is handwritten in IT shops or by services companies that you're engaging. In the future, just like you could think about Apple or Windows or any, any kind of known stable platform, you have third parties bringing in packaged applications, packaged services. You want a database, grab a Cloud Foundry compatible database. You want an app, grab a Cloud Foundry compatible app. Talk to the SAP folks who are here about their vision for the ecosystem. It's tremendously exciting. We're in the beginning of a 20-year revolution of what cloud platforms can be, and we are creating a space for innovation around the platform and sustainability. So let me close with a few, uh, few statistics. This is kind of our Cloud Foundry brag book. Just in the last 12 months, we've had over 31,000 commits, uh, almost 2,500 contributors, and perhaps most importantly, 130 core committers. These are the men and women who spend 40 hours a week building the best code in the industry that runs a discrete distributed system for you. Our newest dojo, in fact, was announced yesterday where core committers will come and train and be added. So SAP is now running a dojo in Waldorf, bringing new core committers to the Cloud Foundry community. And this stems from the good work that SAP has been doing with SUSE, focused on the OpenStack CPI, but going far beyond that into work on Garden and many other components of Cloud Foundry. We also have been growing the number of platforms that we support. So most recently, we added support for VMware Photon. But the key thing to understand here, and if you don't know it yet, is a subsystem called Bosch. And I don't mean Bosch, the industrial company, with the B-O-S-C-H. I mean Bosch, B-O-S-H, the uh, basic outer shell. Those of you who don't know where the term came from, I'll give you a hint. It's like Borg from Google, but plus plus, right? Just increment the R and the G. That's an exercise for the reader. Um, it, Bosch is what, it's our platform for platforms. Right, this is what gives us the multi-cloud capability so we can support all of these different clouds. And let me, let me uh, uh, greatly appreciate Google, who's here today. 
announced their Bosch CPI and the, uh, the fact that Cloud Foundry runs extremely well on Google Cloud Platform. We have grown to 65 member companies, 195 user groups, over 50, 53,000 individuals as part of the Cloud Foundry community, and 132 cities and 56 countries. It's tremendously important that we hold this as a global movement. We need to help all of us succeed. Our, uh, the membership of the foundation has grown. I think this is, a, this is an important slide to me, perhaps not an important slide to everybody, but it is the foundation as a neutral body that owns the code base, that owns the trademark on your behalf. Our job is to be the circle that brings all of you together. So this is the number of companies that keep coming in and saying, include me in the circle. So we have 17 new members in 2016, five new just this week. Assetti Software, Bosch, Comcast, Hexad, and QIO. Uh, we are on a tear as a community, and I'm very grateful to lead it. And let me, let me, uh, let me mention Siemens and then close. So we've include, included the Industry 4.0 IoT as a theme for this conference for the first time. It's incredibly important. Uh, Siemens is an example of a leader choosing IoT and Cloud Foundry. So MindSphere is the Siemens cloud for industry, leveraging CF as a key technology. Strongly recommend you find out more about it, attend their sessions. This is where the rubber meets the road, a horizontal generic platform meeting the needs of heavy industry day in, day out. One of the key reasons they chose Cloud Foundry was because of the multi-cloud environment, giving them choices to be able to run on many clouds at the same time. Collectively, to close, our vision that brings us together and makes us a community is this. We see a world of cloud computing that is ubiquitous and flexible. It supports multi-cloud application environments. It's portable and interoperable, enabling users to go wherever they want. This is actually a revolutionary concept in cloud computing, that the user should have control of where their applications come and go. And finally, one that's vibrant and growing. It underlies a massive and growing ecosystem of applications and services. As a community, we are pragmatic, diverse, and respectful. This is of tremendous personal importance to me because it is the shape of the community, is how we treat each other that determine whether or not this is a place that we want to play the game or, it's a, or if it's a place that we want to leave. For me, it's a place that we want to play the game. We are focused on exchanging practical experience. Prototypes trump theories. We're diverse and inclusive of people across race, gender, orientation, and lifestyle. And finally, we're respectful. We're committed to listening to thoughtful and honest perspectives. And frequently, we need to be quiet so that other people can speak. It's not about being the loudest voice in the room, but about being able to listen to the quietest voice in the room. With that, thank you. Welcome to the Cloud Foundry Summit. Thank you for being here.